Hello everyone, this video is going to be taking a look at exactly what creationism says and predictions can be made from it as a scientific theory. Now we'll also be examining evolution, the evidence, and exactly which side and which theory that the evidence should side with. At the end I'll also be discussing exactly why creationism is no longer a scientific theory, given the evidence. Now I stumbled upon images like these um, several weeks ago, and they're very, very useful in this discussion as they will clearly outline exactly what creationism and evolution both say, and from these images we can draw and make predictions about what would be true if either theory were correct. Now this is the tree of life according to evolution. As you can see we start off with um, the basic animals and then there's a main, major division between invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, we all have vertebrates so we're vertebrates. Moving along to the right you can see that the, the fish are divided into um, those that have cartilage, those which are jawless, and those which are bony, bony being in the middle. From there, amphibians arise, reptiles, um, mammals and birds all arise from reptiles, and so on and so forth from there. Now, this is the image dealing with creationism and exactly what it presents. Now, as you can see, the creationist concept and um, theory has a very different outline and explanation for exactly how life arose. You can see all kinds arriving at the same time, that is cats, lizards, snakes, eagles and penguins and ostriches and invertebrates and dinosaurs all arising at once and from there going on to their individual species. Now I understand there are different types of creationists and many not ne might not necessarily ascribe to this. I will say that every single species was created in its present form. However, I'll, I'm being very generous here in, in giving them that several species can arise from the, from the major types. So now, let's actually test these um, theories. They, they both offer completely different alternatives for how the universe and the world would look if each were true. So let's take a look at those predictions. Now, according to the evolutionary tree, the fossil record should demonstrate um, very simple organisms, very deep down at the bottom, evolving as time goes on with depth to see more and more um, complex organisms. In the fossil record, if evolution is true, we will never find a poodle from the Permian area. We will never find dinosaurs mixed with humans and things like that. The fossil record should, com should display a complete um, temporal stratification and a very, very timely order in which things will appear. Now, if intelligent design or creationism is true, we wouldn't expect this at all. We would expect to find dinosaurs with humans, with um, very, very primitive mollusks and everything, all at the exact same time. There should be no stratification. Everything should be together. Now, when you actually take a look at the fossil record, we see that it clearly matches the prediction that evolution would make. That is to say that we never find human being and dinosaur remains together. We never find 60 million year old poodles. We, don't, we simply just don't find these things. We find that things evolved and their complexity is clearly related to their depth in the strata. Now, this sides completely and unequivocally with evolution. All that one would have to do in the, the hundreds of years that we've been digging is to find a, like I said, a human with a dinosaur or a, or a million year old poodle and evolution would be falsified. That being said, it has never been done and it never will be done. This is because the false record unequivocally supports evolution. Now moving on to the second test. Now the second factor in which we can test the predictability of evolution and creationism would be that if evolution were true, we would predict that certain organisms would have vestiges, that is, um, be it in the form of DNA or physical vestiges or whatnot, of what is left over from previous organisms. Um, let's take, for example, a genetic vestige such as teeth, the genes for making teeth. Chicken don't have teeth, they're birds. If they were designed in present form according to creationism, chickens should not have the genes for making teeth. They were never a reptile, they never made teeth, they simply should not have them. However, if evolution is true, it's possible that chickens would have genes for making teeth, they simply got inactivated and are no longer used. So let's actually examine this. What do we find? Well, when we take a look at organisms such as the chicken, we find that yes, they do indeed have genes for making teeth. Whales also have genes for making legs. In addition to that, human beings have the genes for making fully functional tails with vertebra and under skeletal muscle control. Now this is what we would expect to find under evolution, if evolution were true. However, creationism 
completely flies in the face of this. If everything is created in present form, why do they have these? It makes absolutely no sense. The best, most logical explanation is that it was simply carried over from more primitive organisms that evolved up into the, their present form that we find them now. Once again, this is another prediction that evolution made that reality completely coincides with and is utterly negated by creationism. So thirdly, let's take a look at these trees again. Once more, I'm asking you, what would the universe look like if evolution were true, and what would the universe look like if creationism were true? Well, if creationism were true, we would expect to find massive gaps and discontinuities in the, the different clades. That is, the, the lizards, when you or, or dinosaurs, when you stack them up with um, birds, you should find a massive discontinuity there, be it in the, the DNA sequence, in everything. It should not be a seamless transition. Um, we should find major stumbling blocks. If evolution were true, we shouldn't really find those. We would, have, of course, expect variation because they're different organisms. However, the, the variation should be relatively little, as it is transforming from one into another. Now, keep in mind that this is also a major logical point, in the sense of, if there are no major gaps, well, then the most logical construction of this is to make them without gaps. If you're artificially creating gaps, if you have to do that to make your theory work, then it's obviously not going to work, and it's not the best explanation. So let's take a look at phylogenetic analysis and see if there truly are gaps between those. So when we actually take a look at the, the, the genomes of these organisms, we find unequivocally that there really aren't that many massive gaps in between the transitions that evolution would predict. Um, this completely supports evolution. And just, I'm actually taking a look at the page right now, this just came out the other week. They analyze some information from the Tyrannosaurus rex, and they find that it is more common, or has more in common with, like, chickens and things like that than it does living lizards. I'm posting the link right now. Now, this completely supports evolution. As creationism forces you to create arbitrary marginal gaps in order to make it work. With evolution, those things are explainable because they're non-existent. We can clearly see the transition from one organism to the next, gap-free in both the fossil record, um, embryology, um, comparative anatomy, as well as phylogenetic analysis from DNA. Once again, this completely supports evolution. Now, it is for these reasons that intelligent design has been falsified as a scientific theory. If it were any other theory, people would take a look at that and say, oh, well, you know, we think this, but all the evidence contradicts it, so we're wrong. Now, what can we do? What can we learn from it? What is the right answer? That is what would happen if intelligent design were a scientific theory. However, because it is not, when confronted with these data, they simply have no reply, or they shrug and say, well, that's the way Jesus did it. Now, in reality and in science, using Jesus did it that way as, a reason, as an explanation for why everything contradicts and makes it look like your theory is wrong is, is not a valid argument. And as such, because that is the argument that they are using, intelligent design is not science and is not a valid scientific theory and has no place in the classrooms or in the educated world.